So we're going to be looking at some leading examples of brands using data to support and serve customers better than ever. Generally, we've said until recently, everything we do is about the future of retail. But as we're seeing this blending, it's becoming, I guess we're talking more about the future of brands. And it's a pleasure to be talking to you this afternoon. These are some of the other brands that we help. We call ourselves Insider Trends because we do do a lot of desk research into what's coming next. But we also take a slightly different approach to our research. We go into as many stores that we can find and experience as possible, stores all over the world, to find out who is inventing the future of retail. And we also interview as many people who are creating that future of retail as possible. So it's this slightly different approach, possibly, that means I've been named one of the world's top 50 influences in retail for the past three years by now. So let's see if I can influence you. Now, there are two main things that I want to talk to you about. If any of you have delved into In River's literature, you'll know that they talk about the five Cs. There are three, three Cs I've decided to disregard. These are about having clear data, consistent data, and correct data. This is all very important, but I would consider this housekeeping in a way. My job is often to inspire people. I find it would be quite hard to inspire people around correct data. So we'll look at two of the other Cs. We'll look at how to create compelling and emotional connections with your customers. And then we can talk about contextual selling. So understanding the customer's context and also bringing selling and engagement into their environment rather than expecting them to come to you. So com these compelling and emotional connections. Now this sounds maybe like a nice to have. It sounds a bit Lululemon maybe. Not all brands need this. I would argue differently actually. There's a lot of data to say that if you can engage with customers emotionally, your bottom line will benefit. So if your customer wants to gaze into your eyes as deeply as Kate is gazing into Leo's, you can win big. Your customers can spend up to two and a half times as much with you. They will stay with you on average for 50% longer, so just over five years rather than three and a half years. And if you compound those two things, that means that overall they have a four time, well, their, their lifetime value to you is four times as high over the course of their life. But it's not just that they will spend more with you, they actually become a free marketing channel for you. So customers who are emotionally engaged are three and a half times as likely to recommend you to their friends as someone who isn't emotionally engaged. And we know now that peer-to-peer -peer marketing, word of mouth recommendations, are the most influential form of marketing. So it's, fr it's free, it works, embrace it. So these are some stats for B2C customers, but there are also uh, strong reasons to think about this from the B2B side too. So B2B buyers say that it's actually really hard to differentiate between offerings when they just look at the functional benefits. Only 14% of them can differentiate between offers just by looking at the functions. So there's an opportunity here to connect emotionally and if you can connect with these customers emotionally, 60% of B2B buyers will go on to pay a premium for your product or your service. And that's drastically higher than the 2% who would pay a premium if they are not emotionally engaged. So it's definitely worth chasing these benefits, but we should have a little bit of a reality check. Camp Gemini did an interesting survey where they asked executives if, they, if their brand connected emotionally with customers. And the very encouraging news is that 80% of them said, yes, we do connect. It became slightly less encouraging when Camp Gemini went off and asked customers the same question. The, only 15% of customers agreed with this and said that their brands connect emotionally. 
So this is bad news if you're an overconfident executive in a corner office, but this is good news for every other brand who just wants to work a bit harder. If you can step up, connect emotionally, then you can be ahead of roughly 85% of your competitors. This is worth, worth taking. So that's, this is why. And let's, now let's talk about how you can engage emotionally. Three different sections here to talk you through. We can start by talking about passion brands, brands that move away from just focusing on selling a product and service and start to elevate their mission. Now, it's interesting to see Samsung doing this. Samsung are slowly rolling out more experience spaces around the world. They're doing this to engage both with B2C and with B2B customers. They have um, giant displays that cost half a million dollars in these. I assume they're for business customers. I don't know if anyone wants to spend that kind of money on a new TV. But of course, half of the mission also is to persuade people to move away from Apple. I have a lot of, taken a number of people in here who say they would never leave Apple, but actually after 30 minutes in this space, they start reconsidering it. Now, Samsung get people into the space because they say that this isn't a shop. This is a space for people to come, hang out, do some work maybe, experience a virtual reality ride, experience their graffiti wall, take part in one of 40 different activities that they run each and every week. So this is just about getting customers to spend time, learn something new about Samsung, and gently fall in love with the brand. And this really, this really works. I've seen this um, with, with the groups I've taken in there. So it seems like we can't measure experience, but actually they have KPIs for this space. They're measuring dwell time. They're also measuring the number of people who walk out of this space saying that they would recommend Samsung products. At the same time, they're tracking, this, they're tracking the morale of their staff. Because, of course, all of the staff are there not to sell, but to elevate the experience, add a better atmosphere. So to keep track of this, they've developed a really simple app. Each staff member has a phone in their pockets, and every day they're asked to check into this app and just to log how they're feeling. And after they've logged how they're feeling, they can say what has made them feel this way. So if there's a particular Thing, making people feel miserable, then Samsung can quickly go off and sort that out. So we may feel that experiences are intangible, but actually all of these things can be measured, tracked, and improved. Now, Samsung is maybe a distant example for some people in the room. They spend, on average, about $50 million on each space that they open. So I'm not suggesting that you all go the way of Samsung tomorrow. What I am suggesting is that we take some examples from this and we simplify it where we can. So I think Bobby Brown, the beauty manufacturer, they have taken elements of this idea and incorporated this into their e-commerce. So these are some shots from their website where they make it clear that if a customer knows what they want, it's really easy for them to go off and just self-serve and buy that. But at the same time, they also make it really clear that if a customer needs advice, they can get that same level of advice that they would get in the store online as well, through email, through chat. It's not rocket science. They're just making it clear that that human service is there through all channels. Now, you can boost emotion and engagement by bringing in more content into your offer. And these are some shots of Matches, a third-party fashion retailer, retail, um, re fashion, luxury fashion, basically. They've had quite an interesting story. They started out 30 years ago in bricks and mortar, but they now think digital first. They have only four stores in London, but despite this, they ship to 170 countries around the world. I think there's about 196 countries in total. 
And at a time when most brands would be very happy to make 20% of their sales online, matches sell 95% on, of their, makes 95% of their sales online. So they've totally flipped this, totally reinvented their fortunes because they're connecting with customers through digital. But they understand that they need to offer more than just the transaction. And so this is why they've built content into all of their channels. So some of these earlier shots were of their style daily edit that they've put into the app. And this is designed to be something that customers can check into daily. And a lot of customers do. It's part of their routine on, the way to, on their way to work. But they've neatly combined editorial and shopping together. And even when they opened up their new store, they built opportunities for content in that. So partly it is a store and a showcase for new items, but also they record podcasts and films in there. So they're blending the content and the shopping and the online the, and the offline. It's all, it all feels really coherent and elegant, actually. And what I should say is that they've now learned that 35% of their sales are linked to content. So this is not just a nice to have. They're taking this seriously. They're really thinking as much as they can, like a content and media company. And again, just another nod to putting the human online. What they're doing is actually not rocket science. One of the reasons why they sell so much through digital is, again, they make it clear that you can get that same human service that you get in their physical spaces. All of this is available to customers in 170 countries through their website. Now, possibly the easiest way to connect emotionally with customers is to disconnect yourself, even briefly, from the things, the products that you manufacture and sell. And to start to think about a higher purpose and a higher passion that you can connect with customers around. Now, Hugbury is quite a small business who are some of the, is one of the best companies in the world at this. They have elevated their brand through three different levels that I'll try to tell you about. The first one is that they don't just think about one particular product category. They do sell outdoor adventure items for men. That's really their main focus. But they blend this. They don't just sell clothing. They actually sell all sorts of products, so books and clothing and equipment and things they've developed with partners that are linked to their bigger theme. So it becomes harder to define themselves just through that product. They then elevate things by adding a content side to their business. And this is a core part of their DNA. They started out as an online brand, having um, the blended a, a, an adventure magazine that with shoppable content too. So their roots are in content. And then when they opened up their first physical space, it was really important to them that it felt like a walk-in shoppable magazine. There's as much to discover in the store as there is on their website. Now, the third element is to add experiences on all of this. And again, this, this just decouples the experience from being about product. Now, we've seen some other brands literally open up their own experience arm. There's brands like Rafa Cycle Club who will happily sell you one of their cycle holidays. But Huckbury don't have that kind of budget. So Huckbury have incorporated experiences into their offer by creating itineraries that are delivered through partners. And again, you can get these itineraries on their website and in the store. But it just shows that they really know their topic. Anyone can make a pair of waterproof trousers, but it takes a brand that is truly passionate and knowledgeable about their subject area to make recommendations for all the things you should do outside the store and to say, actually, you should go and visit this other person when you're up in Iceland or up in north, the north of New York or whatever. So it, it just shows that they're really part of this community and they know a lot more. So you can have a think about how you can elevate this as well. Maybe you have a company that sells pipes and taps, which is 
Fair enough, but you could actually elevate this to think about how you can help your customers maybe live their dream lifestyle. And actually, you could show them inspirational content. You could let them submit inspirational content to you. You could recommend partners to them. This, everything can be taken much, much further. So I have some little questions for you at the end of each section just to help you tease out some of the learnings for you. So the key question here is how can you build an emotional connection with your customer? I believe that every brand can do this. And a trick, a tip in how to do this is to think about what your brand stands for beyond product, how you can motivate people. Now our next section is about continuing this relationship, understanding that we can now move away from a traditional structure of producing things in one space and having them consumed in another. This very linear relationship with a start point and an end point. That's now changing. It's now possible to join all of this together, to use the product as another touch point to further learn about customers and engage them, to turn this relationship into something much more cyclical. Now, a good example of this is the Intelligent X beer out of London. I was told you'd enjoy a beer example. This is a beer that is brewed not by a human, but by an artificially intelligent algorithm on an ongoing basis. And so, as a customer, you buy the beer, you drink it, and you're then invited to fill in a questionnaire about your experience of the beer, what you did, what you didn't like. And then in time, all of that data is fed back to the algorithm that will then adapt the recipe for its next iteration. And over time, the beer, with luck, will actually improve and become more customer friendly. So hopefully you can see how this changes the relationship. It used to be that people would just buy a beer, they'd drink it, and either they'd like it or they didn't. It was a binary choice. But now, this almost becomes like an interactive alcoholic soap opera, in a way. You can buy the beer, give your feedback, and see what happens in subsequent months. You can continue to check in to see what's happening. It becomes a lot more interactive. Nike are building in content into some of their products to continue this, their relationship with customers. They've come up with a range of chipped basketball jerseys. These have NFC chips in them. So with the app on your phone, you can tap the, the, this chip, and it will unlock content that is linked to the team of the basketball jersey that you're wearing. So this is just another way to keep customers engaged and in sync with what's going on with their team. It also gives them a reason to buy the official piece of merchandise rather than something on a market or in a back street. To me, this is a very, very compelling offer. And again, they can measure how often customers are engaging. But the one to beat comes from Tommy Hilfiger who, again, have come up with a range of chipped clothing, but they're using it in a much more interesting way than Nike. They have developed a system of treasure hunts, or it's, it's almost like a reward and loyalty scheme. How this works is that the customer pairs their phone with the item once they've bought it, and then every time they leave the house in this shirt, Tommy Hilfiger know about it, and they reward it, and they can reward the customers who wear these shirts the most often and who wear them to the most interesting places. And so this is normally the point where people start to look a bit freaked out and a bit concerned which I do understand, but we need to think about how this changes the relationship with customers. It means that you, they can engage with you far more often, and that's really important because we used to think that the store or in-person interactions were the only place that brands could engage with customers. But now, there are all these other opportunities for engagement and interaction to happen in quite a meaningful way outside the store. In some ways, I think this is crazy, but in other ways, I think it's actually more elegant than having a 
spending-based loyalty scheme. I'd rather reward the people who were most involved in my brand than the people who were just spending the most money with me. So the question here is for you to think about how, to, how your products and services can continue the relationship with the customer rather than just being an endpoint or something where you need to follow up with them a year afterwards. How can you use it to continually learn and optimize your operations? Now our third section is about making the overall experience more human and more elegant, more relaxing perhaps, by applying technology. We, I've seen a lot of brands learn the, learn the hard way that actually putting technology between the brand and the customer is not the way to go, but it actually works when you use it in the background to support a better relationship. This can be quite simple. You can just use it to design out some of the previous pain points for your customers. Now, this is a B2B example. This is from a DIY brand called Alcel over in Sweden. They sell to Scandinavia and out into Russia. They have B2B and B2C customers, actually, but this is the B2B option. They have a lot of customers who will design buildings, small and large. And then the traditional thing to do is once you've designed your building, which has all the product specs within the design, you need to hire someone who will go pick, pick through this design and will essentially turn it into a product list. They will tell your team every single thing that they need to buy to make this happen. And Alcel thought about this, and they thought, this is probably quite slow, it's probably quite unreliable, and it's probably also quite expensive. And so their system now lets customers plug in a design like this, and in the press of a button, it will simply spit out the product list that they need. So this is interesting. I was talking to a team member about this, and they were saying, oh, this is what my uncle does for a living. And it's not actually my job to talk about the ethics of this, but we can think more about perhaps the business benefits of this. I imagine that a, a, de a design company who used this system would actually be able to compete better, be able to lower their prices and promise a faster service to their customers as a result of this. So there definitely are benefits. Now, a B2C company using technology to offer a more human experience is M.M. Lafleur. Are there any M.M. Lafleur customers here? No, no? Okay, all right, there is one. Is, are you, do you shop there or no, you were just moving? Okay, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> All right, sorry, I'm just looking for one person. No, okay, so there is an M.M. Lafleur here in Chicago. They only make workwear for women, so all the ladies, I recommend that you have a look. They've applied technology in the most sophisticated way. They started out as a brand that served customers online, sending customers batches of products that it thought they might like, a little bit like Stitch Fit, Stitch Fit who we saw earlier, but now they're coming offline. But they're using a similar approach in their offline operations. So when a customer books in for an appointment or checks into the space, M.M. Lafleur accesses everything they know about that customer. And they use that information to tailor a closet for that person. So the customer just arrives, they walk straight into this fitting room, and all the products they see are products that are in that customer's size, in colors and styles that they are most likely to like. If they've browsed something or tried something on through the online channel before and returned it, they're not going to see that in this fitting room. And this changes the experience. It makes it more human. Instead of asking the customer to do all of the work and walk up and down aisles and aisles of clothing, it's all there. The customer's time can be spent hanging out with a really lovely human stylist and drinking champagne. And then at the end of it, they have the choice of having those, these products sent to their home as a long, or taking them home with them. But actually, most customers decide to have them shipped to their home. Again, they just want these better, simpler experiences. 
and Mulberry are finding a way to continue the human experience that customers get in the space away from the space. This is a shot of their new store in London, which I did notice earlier has no product in it. This is like the only shot of the space. I assure you it does now have product in it. They have handbags and clothing and things in this. But they are a premium luxury brand. They want customers to have a better experience. So they've given each of their staff um, a, a, an iPhone that lets them save customer information and communicate with the people they've met outside of the store. But it gets, they're, again, supported by technology in that they, it, yeah, there's this system called Tulip that prompts people with who they should be contacting, with which offers and recommendations, and at the right times. And it will actually populate a message for that, that staff member. So they can just top and tail it, tail, tail it with some personal information before sending it off. And that means that customers are going to feel like a real person is communicating with them, and they'll read it rather than ignore it. But this, by starting the relationship in the store, continuing it online through different channels, and by tailoring this information, they've got some fantastic metrics behind this. So Tulip have found that their systems can increase conversion rates across the whole of the ecosystem by, about, by up to 10%. They can increase the order sizes for customers by about 15%. And they can increase the number of repeat purchases by up to 20%. So these metrics are all good in their own way, but of course they can compound. We can multiply them all together to get an uplift of up to 51%. So that means if each of your customers is worth, say, $1,000 a year to you today, you could implement a system like this, and overnight they could be worth $1,500 to you. And again, this is a B2C example, but I'm sure we can apply learnings from this to B2B. We can make, add more AI to our CRM systems to pick out our top customers, people we've not communicated with for a while. So we can prompt people, maybe more people than our salespeople, but actually people on the front line to communicate with our top customers and get similar uplifts like this. So here, it's a very simple question. I just wanted to ask, how can technology disappear into the background and actually support better connections between you and your customers? So how it can act as a bridge more than a wall. Now our last section is about contextual selling. This is a bit shorter than the other one. This is about understanding the customer's context and also bringing selling and engagement to the customer. So again, wrapping your experience around them. Now, there's a business, out, again, out of Sweden, who are able to understand the customer's context much, much better than their competitors. This is Manigo, who sell ingredients to chefs and catering companies all over Sweden. They make it, they support the customer better through a series of different innovations. First of all, they have a strong e-commerce and mobile commerce side. They make it easy for people to order. But they have another tool that lets customers keep track of what's in their fridges and in their cupboards, not just from Minigo, but from all of their providers. And then it uses that information to recommend recipes to the customer. The next step is to say to them, if you bought X, Y, and Z, we'd be, able to off we'd be able to cook all these other things. But I think that's interesting that they're not just tracking what the Menigo products, they're tracking things from other providers as well. That's giving them extra insights that they can use in their business. They're saying, well, all the baked beans come from this provider. We should push more baked beans on this, on this seller. And then once they understand that customer much better, they use all that information to personalize what that customer sees at each time. So different customers will see perhaps higher margin products versus the higher spending ones. They're using what they know in quite an intelligent way. 
But the one, I think the one to beat here is actually Stockwell. I don't know if anyone's seen this. I'm a bit obsessed with this example. Apparently, they're around in Chicago, but you won't see these in public spaces. These are a new form of retail units that bring retail off the street and into people's uh, offices or their schools, gyms, libraries, almost every public place that isn't on the street. And this makes retail really convenient and highly contextual by being Amazon Go in a box, in a way. This is, so how the customer uses this is they download an app. As they walk towards the box, it knows that they are there and it unlocks. They can then take anything they want from this system. And Amazon Go style smart cameras just keep track of what that customer has taken. As they walk away, it will automatically bill them for their, for what they've taken. And I love this because this, again, is very high-tech in some ways, but it's also high-touch. It's very, very human and extremely convenient. Brings retail to the customer. Near, sorry, Near Street is a company that helps customers understand their own context much better by making the real world much more searchable. So, the idea for, the, for Near Street came about from the fact that the founders realized that most people buy online because they can search online. They know with certainty where they can find things. And if they could bring that same level of certainty and searchability to the real world, then more people would buy through that channel. So their solution makes it really easy for stores and also warehouses to keep track of what's in stock and to post that information online. Near Street are now partnering with Google in the UK. So if you search for an item online, you'll see it where it's available through e-commerce sites, but also where it's available near you. And if you can see that something, something is perhaps a 10-minute walk away, you're much more likely to go off and, and try that. So again, this could be a good solution for B2B and B2C. You can track what's going on in your warehouses there. Now, any touch point can have engagement built into it. It can be made much more contextually relevant than it is today, in perhaps in simpler ways than you might think. This is the magazine from Netta Porter, so another luxury fashion retailer. This isn't just something they give away. They charge good money for this. They charge five pounds a time for each edition of their magazine. And obviously, it works in its own right. It's just a way for people to discover what's new. But any time a customer sees something they're interested in, they can scan the page of the magazine with their app, and it will let them go on to find out more and buy through this. Now, this sounds gimmicky, but Netta Porter have realized that the customers who interact and engage the most with this magazine actually go on to spend the most. So you may find that just by bringing a few of your channels closer together, you can sell more to people. And this does, I think, at first glance anyway, it looks fairly expensive and difficult. But I discovered recently that one of my friends uses a free app to run augmented reality treasure hunts for people. So she could just come into this room, take a series of pictures of different things, and then um, and draw things in this. And then I could come along with my version of the app and scan the same item and re reveal all the things that she had drawn. And that app is free. And this is something that she has done without any coding. She's an optician. She's not a, a coder at all. So don't look at this and think that this has to cost hundreds of thousands of pounds. Actually, there may well be a plug and play app out there that will let you do something similar to this. But if you do want a very elaborate example, I certainly can give you one. This is, again, something that's a bit more meaningful than it looks, actually. This is the L'Oreal Smart Connected Hairbrush. And at first glance, the idea with this is that every time you brush your hair, accelerometers and microphones in the hairbrush will be able to detect your hair health, and they will share this with the app, so with the app that, so you can learn about. I think it says things like how brittle your hair is and how fragile it is, the level of breakage. It's not very positive, this hairbrush. 
And so if we just stop there, you would probably think that this design is totally unnecessary and ridiculous, almost. But we need to think about what is going on behind the scenes here. Of course, it's not just you who is getting your data here. All of this data about your hair is going up to L'Oreal HQ, where they can understand what products people are using and what products they should be developing and recommending to people. It's only, they're only one step away from being able to serve product recommendations to this app and adding a Buy Now button to this. So imagine in a few iterations time, what would you prefer to do? Would you prefer to find the right hair products for you over the course of months and spending hundreds of dollars going to your local convenience store and trying out different things? Or would you rather brush your hair, have a recommendation be made to you, and have the right things be delivered to you in just one click? This is why I say that the future of retail and branding generally belongs to those companies who have a relationship with customers rather than those who simply have the most real estate space. So here, the question for you is how can you bring communications and buying to the customer? How can you enter the customer's space rather than expecting them to come to you? And if you're just constantly in the background in the customer's space, I'm sure that you'll find that when they think of a problem that you can solve, you will be the first one that they reach out to. So that's just about it, but a few final questions for you is just for you to think about how you can take action and what you might do next. And a big question is just for you to think about how you define your business. Do you still define yourself as a business who mainly sells products or mainly delivers services? Can you start to embrace these new tools and think of yourself as a retailer? Can you go direct to customers in this new way? And if you're creating some content, can you take that further and imagine yourself in part as being a content company to fully flesh this out and take this really seriously and start to get all these different channels working together? And then once you think about that, you can then think about how you can bring this to life for customers across all of these channels. So linking all of this together to understand them better. And when it becomes, when you do all of this, it can seem like this is possibly quite, quite complicated, quite hard to say what you are ultimately. But if you put this relationship at the heart of your business, it doesn't matter. If you have that relationship with the customer, that will give you that understanding. And if you act on that understanding, you can literally never go wrong. You will always be designing things that the customer wants. So embrace technology. It is going to give you ways to be more human than ever before. Thank you.